Bueno, uh, bienvenidos, bienvenidos al, a, la, al cuarto, a, a la cuarta presentación en el, en el seminario del Laboratorio de Educación del Centro de Modelamiento Matemático de la Universidad de Chile. Uh, hoy estará presentando uh, el doctor Eric Sai. Uh, él es un maestro o, 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 o profesor de matemática de secundaria y también un investigador postdoctoral en la Universidad de Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, él obtuvo su doctorado en Educación Matemática en la Universidad de Georgia, y actualmente él investiga cómo maestros aprenden a dirigir discusiones, uh, discusiones matemáticas. Sus intereses uh, es, también incluyen cómo maestros y estudiantes aprenden a usar representaciones matemáticas desde el jardín infantil hasta el quinto grado. El interés está más en, en, en básica. Um, hoy la, la presentación va a ser en inglés, uh, pero parte del PowerPoint está en español también uh, para que se pueda seguir de, de mayor facilidad. Y también voy a um, hacer la introducción de Eric en inglés porque tenemos algunas personas que también uh, son de habla inglesa. Uh, el título de la presentación de hoy día de Eric uh, se llama Aprender a dibujar y dibujando para enseñar. Reflexiones para el aprendizaje de maestros. Well, welcome everybody. I'm gonna uh, introduce our speaker today too. We're gonna do it in English as well, so we can uh, welcome everyone. Uh, today, Dr. Eric Sai is gonna be presenting his work titled "Learning to Draw and Drawing to Teach: Considerations for Teacher Learning." Uh, Eric Sai is a former high school math teacher and is a postdoctoral research at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He obtained his PhD in mathematics education at the University of Georgia, and he currently focuses on how teachers learn to, to lead discussions in the classroom. His interests also include how teachers and students learn to use mathematical representations in K-5, to K through five, grade five, right? Um, Oh, entonces, vamos, vamos a iniciar la presentación. Uh, les, les vamos a pedir que por favor uh, ap apaguemos las cámaras como para ahorrar un poquito el ancho de banda y la presentación salga bien. Y, y lo, los micrófonos también los vamos a mutear y después los vamos a desmutear cuando la presentación comience. Um, so, I wanted to tell everyone if you could please turn off your, your camera while the presentation is going to um, make sure that the internet can handle the presentation. And uh, we're gonna mute the microphones for now while Eric is presenting, but then we're gonna unmute them for the question section. Eric, I think- Yes, You can time. start now if you, if you want. All right, perfect. All right. Uh, Daria, can you see this black screen? Sí, yep. Okay. Hola, buenas tardes. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Eric. And as Daria said, I will be um, doing this presentation in English, but I have translated the slides in Spanish. Spanish? Um, uh, someone has their mic on. Okay. So um, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, thanks for taking the time to um, come in this Zoom room. I know. You know, there are a lot of things that are unsure and we don't necessarily want to do like uh, work, but here we are, so I really appreciate the time. I intend to talk for around 45 minutes. Um, and as I said, the slides are in Spanish. The reason, there are two reasons. Number one, I want to honor where we are, where we are uh, at the University of Chile. So I want to make sure that I honor the cultural um, language of, of, of the area. But I also talk very fast <laughs> in English. So I just wanted to make sure that there's a lot of support. The other thing that I would um, want to do is um, I'm going to do a sound check. Um, so you might hear a few beeps um, just to see that you can hear the sound coming from my computer. It should be playing now. We, we, we can hear it, yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, cool. Also, I recommend if you're not wearing headphones and if you have access to some to put them in because when we get to the videos, you might it might be helpful to hear what the students are saying. So before I begin the formal presentation, I wanted to introduce myself a little more. 
Um, and by doing that, I am going to take you on a 16 hour flight from Santiago to Madison. So I took this from Google Earth, just so you know where, where, where I'm located. I also, and I think my camera's still going, I also made to celebrate, I told Daria I would make Curanto. It's right here, I don't know if you can see it, but um, <laughs> it's, it's it, I don't know, I, it, it's not gonna taste right. <laughs> I don't eat a lot of red meat, so there's not a lot of right ingredients in it, but I love seafood, so I'm gonna have that later for dinner. As I told Daria, I made a big pot of it. Um, thank you, YouTube. I've watched a lot of YouTube videos to make it. Apparently you don't make it in one way. And you make it apparently out on a fire. Okay, so here we are. So we're flying from the University of Chile all the way to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. In real life, it would take 16 hours with two layovers. One thing that's great about, um, well, the silver lining about the pandemic is we can do this cross-cultural exchange. So Madison, Wisconsin is located here in the Midwest part of the United States. It's right next to the Great Lakes. It's three hours from Chicago, one and a half hours from Milwaukee. We're located in the capital of Wisconsin, which is Madison, um, native land of the Ho-Chunk Nation. And there are two lakes here in Madison and the university is right on this lake. So usually over the summer, people would, uh, there's a terrace where people can uh, eat and drink and enjoy the view of the lake, but because of the pandemic, it's been a little limited. Um, this is great. I don't like long flights. I don't like long flights. I don't like long drives. So this, this was perfect for me. Um, when I was in high school, this is a picture of my high school gym. And if you can't tell, I went to a Catholic high school because of what's on top of the gym. Um, I um, uh, was in algebra class and our teacher, Larry, taught with a lot of symbols and I didn't understand a lot of what he was saying. So what I started to do is in the margins of my textbook, I would make these small drawings or diagrams to help me understand uh, the math that was being talked about in class. Um, what eventually happened is um, my classmates would ask me how I understood the math and I would use the drawings and diagrams to help them, my classmates, think through what was happening in class. And I said, okay, I'm gonna become a math teacher because if this is working with my class, I can do it as a teacher. I've cracked the case. I'm gonna be the best, best math teacher in the world. It's gonna be great. So I enrolled in a teacher preparation program at the university and I became a math teacher. The first class they asked me to teach was algebra two, the same class that I was in that I struggled with. And I was like, we're gonna use drawings. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be the best class in the world. I found the first worksheet I made as a teacher and this is what it looks like. <laughs> You'll see there's not a lot of opportunities for drawing and thinking in other ways aside from symbols. And so I thought maybe, you know, maybe my math teacher was right. Maybe the right way to teach algebra is just through symbols and no other way. But as a teacher, I knew that this was unfair because as a student, I knew that drawings and diagrams were helpful, but as a teacher, I couldn't provide it. So that's what got me on this, um, this, this career path of understanding how can we incorporate drawings in math class. And the literature in math education supports a lot of this. We know that um, drawings and diagrams help uh, people problem solve. They help us make mathematical argument, arguments and communicate our ideas. We also see that drawings are part of the community of mathematicians. In other words, this is what mathematicians do. And here in America, it's really important for us to provide access for students because our medium of instruction is in English and not a lot of our students come from homes where they speak English primarily. We need to provide them more access. And although um, drawings is not the solution, it does help provide access for students just a little bit. So with all this nice stuff, why is it so difficult for us as teachers and teacher educators to incorporate drawings in classes? Uh, we need a paradigm shift in the way we think about representations. So to start the presentation formally, I'm gonna start with my conclusion slide. Here's the conclusion, that teachers and students should use drawings as part of rigorous mathematical thinking. I'll let you think about that for a few seconds. So for a lot of us, this sounds right. It's like, yeah, Eric, obviously this is no, no questions, but uh, there is a shift that needs to occur. And if the shift deals with how we view representations in class, and I can, I've traced where I think um, some issues are back to this uh, book. This is Jerome Bruner. If, um, if you're in a teacher prep program like me, you heard him in your learning theories course. And in the math pedagogy one in particular, they zero in on this, these two pages. 
where he asks, what is meant by representation? And he answers it using three forms of representation that we may all have heard, iconic and active and symbolic. Iconic, where you have something that you can perceive to manipulate. You have inactive, which um, is based on um, uh, uh, the concrete in a more abstract way and the symbolic, so our, our variables and our numerals. Um, we in education took this as part of our mathematics instruction. And the way we've taken it is we view these as levels that students start off with concrete, then we go to pictures, and then finally end with this abstract symbolic representation. And we see this in a lot of curricula. My friends in Chile, I did look at your uh, curricula. Um, so we see this here in this um, document. So I apologize if these aren't the appropriate documents to look at, but um, you, can, you can say in the chat which should documents I should have been looking at. So you have the Metodología Copisi Concretas, Pictorias y Simbólicas. And in another document, you can see that um, they're describing that students have to progress from concrete to symbols. Chile is not the only uh, national curriculum that calls upon this. The famous Singaporean curriculum identifies this as well in a concrete pictorial abstract approach. And um, if you listen to one of their scholars, Yap Ben Har, he would usually say that Singaporean curriculum is marked by, is, is, um, is unique, not unique, but uh, CPA is an important part of the Singaporean curriculum. Here in the United States, as with most things, we're not immune to this. So this is a, a book that um, uh, has framed a lot of our mathematics curriculum across the 50 states. It was published 20 years ago, but we still use it. And we can see how um, it frames the same thing. Uh, primary school students use objects to represent middle grades, they become more abstract. And in high school, they have conventional representations, in other words, variables and numbers. So we see this idea of levels, concrete, then pictures, and then abstraction. So this idea of levels is interesting to me because I don't think it's an accurate portrayal of how STEM professionals work and how people engage in the world outside of mathematics. Let's take a look at some chemistry. Um, I don't know if my dad is on this call. He might be, I don't know, but he's a chemical engineer and he's going to test me right now. But anyways, um, this is a picture of a molecule that a lot of scientists, particularly chemists, use to understand molecular structures and uh, ideas in chemistry. You notice that um, they don't go for abstraction. They are fine working within this pictorial um, space. In physics, it's the same thing. This is a notebook from a uh, scientist, Marie Curie. And you can see in her notebook that she has a few diagrams in addition to all the other um, the, the annotations around the notebook. So it's part of her thinking in physics as well. You've also had a few uh, mathematicians um, come speak with you um, in, the, in these talks at Chile. Um, and they've provided um, evidence as well that um, visualization and models are useful for rigorous mathematical thinking. So we can see that in professional STEM, drawings are part, they, they're not the beginning, they're part of uh, rigorous mathematical and scientific thought. In other areas outside of mathematics, in some cases, the concrete is the goal, such as in arts and literature. Without having the concrete as, as a goal, you wouldn't have something like this, the Gigante de Atacama that a lot of you are familiar with. In this case, the point is to make something concrete that's not only culturally relevant, but also scientifically important for the community. We also see in the way we communicate with people that we use pictures as a part of our ideas and our speech. If you've seen this interview of the American president um, where he's trying to make a mathematical point, he's going to use a picture or a diagram to make the point. Whether that point is correct or not, we won't talk about, but what I'm trying to say is he's communicating it with a picture. I think it would be unfair to say that Jerome Bruner thought that it's purely levels. I'm pretty sure he, he might've thought differently and I'm pretty sure a lot of um, uh, scholars think differently as well. However, we, there is um, this idea that concrete idea Concrete ways of doing mathematics are unsophisticated. They're for children. That's why we ask kids to not use their fingers when they're counting, because that's not the way we do math. You have to do it in your head, because that's more formal. Um, so there, even though I don't think we think that, we do it a lot in practice. Concrete first, then pictures, then finally the goal is abstraction. So what's the paradigm shift that I'd like us to think about? I'm going to use a metaphor to explain the paradigm shift. 
this is a picture of Coron in the Philippines. Um, if you're trying to plan a vacation, I suggest going to Coron um, when the pandemic's over, you know, safely. Um, but in such a pretty environment, you have uh, different things. You have the local um, uh, uh, trees, you have the local animals, you have the local community, and you all have, you have tourists that come to this beautiful place. And these three sectors make a really great ecology and what makes Coron this complex, multifaceted, amazing place. And some, uh, uh, depending on the time of the year, such as December, when there aren't as many tourists, the local flora and fauna tend to, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, they get better, you know, uh, the local community also gets better because people start coming home. So when we look at something like this, and we see a picture and some symbols, we think we should think of this as like an ecology where there are multiple things working together. One thing is more important than the other, depending on what we're using this for. So in some cases, I might use this display and concentrate on the right side with the symbols, or I might use the left side with the diagram or the picture in order to make a mathematical point. So it comes together on, in a nice ecology. So instead of thinking about concrete pictures and abstraction in terms of leveling that one has to happen before the other, we can think of these three things as an ecology. So they work together, nothing is more important than the other. And that's why the conclusion of this talk is that the uh, drawings are a part of rigorous mathematical thinking, as opposed to, so what I'm not saying is this, drawings are used to introduce rigorous mathematical th thinking. As I said, it's, it's a part of it. I don't think it's supporting rigorous mathematical thinking because when you support rigorous mathematical thinking, that means it's not important, it's in the background. There's a lot of work in, there. actually, you know, let me say this again, there's not a lot of work in understanding how teachers um, think through representations and pictures and diagrams. As um, this article outlined that majority of the teachers uh, she interviewed think that representations are not a central idea in middle school mathematics. So we can't blame ourselves because we've, um, we're in this mathematics culture where um, we think that um, representations don't play a role, that they're naive, that they're unsophisticated. By the way, this was published in 2010. So if you're trying to look for a research idea, read this article and see if you can build on it. Um, so back to our conclusion slide. So this is the, the um, idea I'd like to present to you today. And I'm going to do it using these two studies. The first study is with prospective teachers who want to teach middle grades. And middle grades means grades six through eight. Um, they're enrolled in a university course where they're learning math. So it's not a pedagogy course, it's a math course about um, middle school topics. And I did an ethnography with them and I'm going to use an analysis of their written work today. The second study I'm going to talk about in a bit is um, with, uh, with uh, in-service teachers. They teach um, primary school grades one through five. Uh, actually, the teachers I work with um, taught grades three through, te they teach grades three through five. They're in a professional development focused on mathematical argumentation. And this is a preliminary analysis of their thinking. Um, I do want to say that we are still collecting data in the second study. The pandemic has um, um, stopped us from collecting a little more data and I don't think we'll be collecting data for a while. If you have any questions about the particulars about the studies themselves, I can answer them in the Q&A. The reason why I wanted to talk about these two um, uh, studies is they're interesting because they fall along the lines of a professional development continuum. A university course is on the side of specific, uh, uh, specific uh, professional development. We're in, there's a specific curriculum that we should follow. Day one, we do this. Day two, we do this. Day three, we do this. Day four, there's a test. And the teachers don't really get a say in how and what uh, to learn. On the other end of the spectrum is the professional development, which is a more adaptive uh, version where we ask the teachers, so what do you wanna to learn today? And so we think through these ideas based on the goals of the teachers, not necessarily the facilitators. I can answer a little more again about these two professional developments in the Q&A as well. So let's talk about the first study. It's about, gonna be about the division of fractions. Particularly, we're gonna see how prospective teachers thought through this algorithm, the invert and multiply algorithm. Why does this work? 
And the specific question that we're going to try to think through today is how do um, prospective teachers use drawings and other representations to explain previously learned mathematical ideas. And I'm saying previously learned because they know this algorithm from when they were students and they're revisiting them now as, uh, as undergraduates. Before we get into the, the drawings, I do want to take note that they were also using a very specific definition of symbols and this may not be a, a this should be familiar, well, I would assume it's familiar to a lot of people that in defining multiplication, we have groups and the number of objects in one group and the number of objects across all the groups. And so we have an example like this. There are three empanadas on one plate. There are four plates. Therefore, there are 12 on one plate. And we can see that uh, the plate is functioning as a group. The, the symbols are going to change if we change what a group is. So instead of using a plate, let's use a tray. So we have um, 12 empanadas on one tray. We want one fourth of the group or the tray. Therefore, we have three empanadas. So in this definition, we're counting two different things. We're counting objects and we're counting groups, such as we're counting um, empanadas or we're counting the plates. You'll also see tape diagrams and their strategy. And a tape diagram usually looks like this. It's a rectangle and you chop it up and you use it to think mathematically. What you'll see is the teachers interpreting these small parts of the rectangle as um, the number of groups, but you'll also see them um, interpret these parts as the number of objects. What the, what's interesting is they're going to think about it at the same time, that they can think about it in terms of groups and the number uh, and the objects. So here's a, um, a math problem that they were working on. Two thirds serving of noodles contains 120 milligrams of sodium. How much sodium is in one serving of noodles? I'll give you another minute to read this. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at um, Elizabeth. Elizabeth first draws out these symbols that um, uh, notice she does it in terms of a division equation and rewrites it in terms of a multiplication equation. This is the first thing she does. She's also interpreting what the numbers mean. You'll see she's using color. She's the one that colored this, not me. Um, and saying that my groups are my serving and that my milligrams are my units or my objects. So what she's saying is that, okay, my groups are here and my objects is this. So how did her tape diagram come out? First, she did this. She drew a tape diagram of one serving. You have one third, one third, one third, colored in two of those pieces and said this is two thirds of a serving. It's also 120 milligrams. She took one of those pieces, so one third part, and she knew that one third part was also 60 milligrams because 120 divided by two is 60. She used this part to build up the serving again. I need three of these to get the full serving. A third, a third, a third, also 60, 60, 60. Therefore, there are 180 milligrams in, the, in one serving of noodles. Notice here where she's interpreting this one small part of her strip as one third of a serving, her groups, and 60 milligrams, her objects. So that's what, um, uh, uh, what the, in the slides before this were about. So you see that there wasn't anything about the inverse and multiply algorithm. So how did they think about it? Well, the, the instructor of the course just said, well, can you explain it now that you've solved the problem? So in other words, um, she is asking the teachers to say why 120 divided by two thirds is equal not to 180, but to 120 times three halves. We're gonna take a look at another teacher's work, Christina's. It's very similar to what we saw with Elizabeth and you can see that, um, that part being defined as a serving and, a, and milligrams at the same time. But I wanted to focus in on this part where Christina does a lot of her thinking. And here's what she does. She says, okay, I'm gonna start with 120. To get the one part, I need half of it. So that means multiplying 120 by a half. I need three parts of, I need three of these. So I need three of, the, of those pieces. Therefore, I get 180 milligrams. Also, I also get 120 times three halves. I'll recreate her strategy right now. She started off with this uh, picture where she's um, using the, the, each part as both a serving and milligrams. And she's looking at these two um, parts over here. Let's call this the original. So what she's doing is she's interpreting the new parts, not just in terms of servings and milligrams. She's also looking at it as original. So that one part has a new uh, uh, value, which is half of the original. And this is 120 milligrams. So 
in one original, in one group, there's 120 milligrams. We need three halves of this group, therefore we get 180 milligrams. So in this way, if we take a look at the two sides of the equation again, initially El Elizabeth was thinking about um, one group as this, as one serving. But when asked to explain the invert and multiply algorithm, they changed the group to the original. So in this case, it was one group. So there had to be another level of interpretation with um, this diagram that it's not just about groups or objects, it was also about the original group that they were, um, they were looking at. So you can see how the teachers were bouncing between the symbols and the picture, that not one thing was the ultimate um, um, uh, goal of, of understanding, that the picture supported the symbols, but the symbols also supported the picture. Um, I have another example uh, from proportional reasoning and you can ask about it um, in the Q&A portion. So let's go back to the conclusion. So as we saw the, the types of, of representations, the symbols and the pictures helped uh, the teachers think about this, um, this uh, division of fractions that is honestly, I find it difficult to understand and I didn't know why until a few years ago and I'm like 30 something, so that's fine. Let's go on to the second study. The second study is the one with in-service teachers engaged in a professional development program. And just um, to remind you that um, if you're not wearing headphones right now, now I recommend wearing it now if you can, um, just because we're about to hear some video. So the question for this study is, how do in-service teachers use drawings to support student understanding? And before we go into this question, I do wanna talk about the professional development they were in. It's something called a learning lab. Um, it is similar to lesson study as you hear it, um, and I can uh, answer questions about the difference between a learning lab and a lesson study in the Q&A. So the lab usually starts off with a phase called new learning, where the teachers um, want uh, uh, talk about a particular idea they want to work on that day, such as argumentation or participation or representations or questioning. Um, based on the discussion, we will we the lab plans a lesson together. They'll do the lesson together in a classroom and they'll come back together and think about what just happened in class in order to plan the goals for the next lab. In this lab we're going to look at, we're going to look at how they planned using these two representations in order to understand the commutative property of multiplication. It's two plots of cabbages, a six by three plot and a three by six. The data we're going to get, uh, we're going to see today is a little bit from the learning lab and you can see the pieces of paper of the, um, of the drawing on the table and on the easel. And we're going to um, look at two teachers in the lab in particular, Melissa and Olivia. What's interesting about Melissa and Olivia is they teach the same group of students. However, Melissa teaches them in English, Olivia teaches them in Spanish. The reason why this type of um, uh, instruction happens is at the school, they have something called a dual language immersion program where students can opt to have instruction in Spanish even if they don't speak Spanish at home. So when we listen to videos later from Olivia, when you hear students, if they have accents, they, it, yes, you're hearing an accent because they usually speak English at home. What you aren't going to hear today is the students saying the commutative property formally. We're not going to get to that part. What I will focus on, however, is how they use the drawings to have beginning conversations about the commutative property. So how do the teachers um, support the students to think about the commutative property with drawings? And what, what role did the drawings play? There are three specific ways that we saw the teachers using the drawings. Number one is to um, support students to use precise language. Number two, to quantify situations. And number three, to construct mathematical arguments. And I'll go with uh, each one at a time. And let's start with the precise language. So during the lab when they were planning, they were like, okay, we want students to think about the commutative property of multiplication. And so they wrote down what they think the commutative property of multiplication is. And you can see it here, the order of the factors doesn't matter when the factors are the same. And they were thinking about this specific definition in reference to this particular drawing. The question is, they, they were going into a third grade class. So to expect third graders to say the order of factors doesn't matter, that they, they weren't gonna, they knew they weren't gonna hear that pretty quickly. But they, what they did wanna know is what language would they use? Would they even use the word factors? When they see this picture, how would they describe it? And so like, that's our opening question. 
So in the lab, they said, our first question when we show this picture is, what do you notice? Que notamos? And the reason why they wanted to ask this question in particular was to see what type of language that they were going to use. Are they going to use the word factors, rows, columns, products? I will tell you right now that the third graders did not use the word factor or product, but they did use rows and columns. The drawings helped students and the teachers quantify this particular situation. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am not the foremost expert in quantitative reasoning. There are three other people on this call that can answer any of those questions, one of which is Dario. So Dario, you can, you can take those questions if, if they come to you. Um, so what I'm going to play is video from the class um, of, of what the students notice right after the teachers ask them, what do you notice? Que notamos? Here's the first one that we did in lab. So I heard a lot of really good discussions. I would love if some people could share what they noticed about the pictures that we have up here on the board. Sadie, what did you notice? I'm going to write it down, kind of what you say. The exact same picture, except one's upright and one to the side. OK, so you're noticing that they're the same picture, but one is upright and one is to the side. OK. Should I just write it exactly as they say it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go to Melissa, uh, Olivia's classroom. She's going to ask the same question again. ¿Qué notamos de estos repollos y luego María y Eric? Camila, ¿qué notamos aquí? Que yo noto es que como uh, María um, Marías está como tilted, ¿cómo se dice? Tilted, que está volteado. Voltado de Eric. Okay. Como, como así, Eric's. Let's listen to what students in Melissa's class said. Oh. Look, right over to the side. If you were to like flip the perspective, you would just need a different perspective and you can see that. Sorry, oh, can you stop. Um, but you would see if you flip the perspective, then this would be exactly like Maria's. By the way, I, I'm sorry I didn't tell you this before. Melissa is using a four by five grid instead of a six by three because this is her second lesson in this unit. Okay, so notice the descriptions of the students. I would say they're geometric. They're describing like one's upright and one's on its side. You tilt or you flip it. Um, and so they're using this language that doesn't necessarily, uh, we don't know if what they're attending to in terms of the values or the quantities in the problem. Um, Melissa grabs some cubes to help support the students. Maybe if I grabbed cubes, they would think about the number. And let's listen to how one kid interprets the cubes. So do we think this matches? Yes. Yes. Yeah, matches pretty well, actually. So now, what are we doing, Lewis? You were saying we're, we're flipping something. Zach, what do you think? How can I change these out? You put this one on here, and then it would be the same as oh. here. OK, so I'm not sure if you were able to see, but there were five um, stacks of cubes with four in each. And then the student grabs one of the stacks and puts it underneath the other stacks. So he's moving this. Now, it's still, we're still not at the commutative property yet. So the teachers knew that the power in this question of what do you notice can support kids to uh, think about what else can we see? So they keep on asking the same question over and over again. What do you notice? What do you notice? As Melissa asks the question again, she hears this response from one of her students. I think it's the same because um, it's basically like just switching the numbers. It's just switching the numbers. What do you mean? Do you think you could come up and show me that? If I give you the marker, could you show me what your thinking is? Other friends, you can put your hands down for now. I think it's just like, like you have four, and then she has four like that, but then Eric has five, and she has five like that. Okay, so now we start to hear, okay, there's a four and a five. All right, there's a four and a five. Okay, we got that down. Um, what else do we know? Um, when Olivia kept on asking, ¿Qué notamos? There's students also notice something. So I'm just, I'm not going to play the video for you, but if you notice on the piece of paper, María tiene seis columnas and the other numbers are, um, were noticed by the students. The question is now, are the numbers related? 
So take a listen to what one of what uh, um, uh, one of Olivia's students say about the columns and rows. Bueno, vamos a regresar a la idea que dijo Milo al principio. Cuando dijiste que los dos son iguales, luego usaste algunos números para mostrar algo. Porque seis, seis veces. Porque los tres grupos de seis. Okay. Seis, 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 you know, we're almost there. This is what the teachers are intending with that planning sheet. You remember they had the rows and columns and circles. And now um, uh, Olivia asks the class, well, what else can we do with the, what uh, Milo just noticed? No sé si alguien escuchó que Milo, tú dijiste algo también un poco diferente además de esto. Que dijiste que es como, y creo que estabas usando, Otra operación. O sea, multiplicación. multiplicación. Seis por tres y tres por seis. Seis por tres y tres por seis. Son iguales. Tú dices que seis por tres es igual a tres por seis. Sí. Ok, so... You know, if, if we were thinking of the levels of concrete picture abstract, we'd say, yep, we got it, we're done. We got the, we got the symbols down. Um, so this is the first time among all the lesson that we watched is where um, we were able to get the, the symbolic notation of six times three is equal to three times six. Now, notice how um, throughout this interaction that, um, especially in Olivia's class, well, across all the classes, that the drawings were part of how students reason through groups. They initially didn't think of groups and then they eventually got there. Now what's, what's great about the teachers we work with is they do view representations as part of rigorous mathematical thinking. So even though Olivia's class was able to get six times three equals three times six, the, the writing, um, from her class, she knew that she had work to do. Part of the, the data that we have is that we, um, we go to their classes and film them outside of the labs and what we do is we record them and then we play the video for them in a, something called a video stimulated recall, which a lot of instructional coaches do, where we say, watch the video, pause it when you like, and tell me what you were thinking. So this is what Olivia said about this lesson. Y creo que esto es más o menos donde habían terminado con Ms. Mm -hmm. que apenas notaron um, que no mostraban o no estaban hablando de filas y columnas tanto, solo que mostraban algunas ideas específicas. Creo que ella dijo que se veían diferentes uh -huh. y se veían como el opuesto. Uh -huh. um, y luego que notaron 3 y 6, pero no um, notaron los números 3 y 6, pero no hablaron tanto o no alcanzaron de hablar específicamente tres filas o tres columnas o cómo se veía. Entonces, Yo no llegué o alcancé mucho a la práctica de la propiedad conmutativa um, porque algo que yo estaba esperando o que yo no sabía qué esperar era cómo iban a no, no específicamente entender el contenido en español y luego el lenguaje, pero cómo iban a poder transferir la plática que habían tenido en inglés uh -huh. ahora a palabras en español. So what Olivia is saying is that she knows that there's still more work to be done in order for students to first use the language that they were anticipating of rows and columns and see she was unsure if they were using it, especially because they've had instruction in English about this. Um, and she said, like, there's, we're still not really at the commutative property, that she's not stopping with the symbols or the abstraction. She needs students to engage more with the picture. So what happens next? We, we have three times six equals six times three. Part of um, 
the thing that the teachers wanted to learn about is how to support students to make mathematical arguments, as we saw at the first part of this presentation. Communicating with pictures and symbols are important in the way we communicate mathematical ideas. So in the lab, they, uh, the teachers came up with a particular question to support students to write down mathematical arguments. Here's what, how they um, asked students to make a mathematical argument. Okay, pero qué pasaría si yo les dijera esto? María está convencida que tiene más repollos que Eric. No, 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 no. Entonces, ¿cómo puedes convencerle a María que María, tú no tienes más repollos o oh, tiene más repollos? María está bien convencida. No, yo tengo más repollos que Eric. Comparte con la misma persona. ¿Qué le dirías a María para convencerla de que María tienes lo mismo que a Eric? ¿Qué le dirías a María? So what the what Olivia is asking her students to do is to talk to Olivia, who is convinced that she has more cabbages than Eric. What would you tell her? And so it, by this way, she's asking her students to make a mathematical argument as to why they think they're equal or not. In class, they've established that they have equal um, number of cabbages in both plots. Now make a mathematical argument. Um, and so the, the idea was for them to use the picture in order to make such a mathematical argument. Um, and that's part of a lot of um, curricular things as well um, in Chile, where you have this particular standard where you, we have to give students opportunities to use um, um, words, but also written work, which includes drawings. So over the course of, of seeing um, the professional development, we saw how teachers supported students to use uh, drawings as part of mathematical thinking that if it wasn't there or if they stopped using it, then probably it wouldn't be as rigorous um, of mathematics and the discussions would be very different. So as I close today's um, presentation, I want to reiterate uh, three of the main ideas that I'd like you to take away with. First is for teacher educators, those who support teachers, especially at the university level, is that when we do these courses where, where we ask our teachers to think about mathematics, is to provide them with opportunities to use ways of mathematics that may not be part of how they used to do mathematics. In other words, we saw our teachers in the first study use drawings to understand something they understood symbol, well, not understood understood, but they use symbolically, but they to use drawings to support what they knew about this. Oh, I'll use the word support, huh? There was my other slide. Um, the second thing that I'd like you to take away is those who work with in-service teachers. We saw how important drawings were in terms of assessing students, especially with what language or what language the students would use. It also helped them create rich discussions because they were using different representations and ideas to, to form mathematical ideas. And finally, across um, everyone, teachers, teacher educators, and researchers, to think about the ecology aspect of representations, that they are a part of this complex thing of mathematics, and that um, we, should, we should start figuring away from levels, and we should see pictures as legitimate ways of doing mathematics. And so I'd like to end today first with um, some thanks, Samuel Aguirre and Chris Paulus, who helped me translate these slides. My Spanish is at best, like first grade level. So I'm not, I'm not gonna say that I did all of this on my own. Um, Sam and Chris work in, um, at the university and they both specialize in language learning, especially in language learning. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation and I will open the chat room for any questions. Oh, oh. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, that was a great presentation. And Um, muchas gracias, Eric. Uh, esa fue una, una presentación muy interesante. Um, ahora vamos a empezar con la parte de las preguntas. Si tienen preguntas, por favor, uh, pueden escribirlas en el chat uh, y nosotros se las vamos a preguntar a Eric y después para que Eric se las pueda responder a ustedes. If you have any question, please just write your questions on the chat uh, and then we are going to ask Eric those questions and you can have your answer. See, we have a seems to be the first question here, Eric. 
Yeah, Berkeley. I really, from mm -hmm. Berkeley Everett. Yeah, I really enjoyed this presentation. I, I'm wondering how words like sophisticated or efficient might interfere with our appreciation for students' drawing. Mm. And so, what language you would recommend? Let, let me kind of translate it in Spanish. So, uh, Berkeley Everett, espero que haya pronunciado el, el, el nombre bien. Uh, tiene la primera pregunta, que dice que Derrile realmente disfrutó la presentación y que ella se está preguntando si acaso palabras como sofisticado o eficiente pueden interferir uh, en la apreciación que tienen los estudiantes acerca del dibujo. Y si estas palabras interfieren, ¿qué, la, qué lenguaje recomendaría Eric? So, this is an interesting question, Berkeley. Um, I'll start with the word efficient. Um, and Daddy, I don't just tell me if you want to stop as you're um, thinking through this. Um, I think efficient is interesting because students have different ideas of what they think efficient means. Okay, um, let me let me go there. So, Eric está diciendo que la primera palabra que va a empezar es eficiente, uh, porque los estudiantes tienen diferentes significados para esta palabra. Because, like, if you think of efficient, sometimes we think of efficient algorithms, which just means quicker. <laughs> Porque a veces cuando piensa en la palabra eficiente, uno inmediatamente piensa en, en algoritmos que sean rápidos. Um, so, I can see how that could interfere. Sophisticated is interesting. I'm not 100% sure about that. I know I use the word sophisticated in the presentation. Um, la palabra eficiente definitivamente interferiría y si estamos, si estamos pensando en algoritmos rápidos. Uh, la palabra sofisticado también es interesante. Um, why don't you say about sophisticated? No, it's okay. I think that's it. Um, but it's a good <laughs> question, Berkeley. I think the language that we could use, well, I would wonder if you want to qualify or um, put value on the drawings as more sophisticated and less sophisticated. In some cases, simple me could be sophisticated. Oh, yeah, no, no, I understand that. Yeah, I, I read it. I'm reading it right now. So I, I'm wondering, um, um, uh, Maybe, maybe just not attaching value could be a great start and not calling something sophisticated. Let me, let me translate that. Yeah, sure. So, Eric está diciendo que la palabra, la palabra eficiente puede interferir, pero también la palabra sofisticado tiene mucho, mucha carga de significado, sobre todo en juicio de valor. Entonces, eso puede interferir en el, en el razonamiento de los estudiantes. Y la verdad es que él recomendaría tratar de no llamar algunos dibujos más sofisticados o menos sofisticados que otros para no interferir. Porque I'm actually reminded of a video in the CGI books where, um, um, where the teachers ask, what do you like about the drawing? I wonder if that's a great way to frame it to students. What do you like about the drawing? And then what, what values the students would attach to the drawings? I would be interested to know what they would say and use those words instead of us culturally saying, you have a sophisticated drawing. Maybe that's, that's one way to approach it. Eric, Eric, Eric sugiere que en lugar de nosotros, como, como maestros y profesores, ¿verdad? Atestarle juicios de valor a los, a, a los dibujos de los estudiantes, preguntarle a los estudiantes, por ejemplo, ¿qué es lo que te gusta de este dibujo? ¿Qué, qué encuentras interesante? O que ellos le atachen ciertos valores a los dibujos, a sus mismos dibujos y a los dibujos de los compañeros. Yeah, so Berge, I hope I answered your question. I, I know, like, um, that might not be fully answered question, but it's a great question to think about, especially in PD. Any other questions? Alguna otra pregunta? If you don't have any questions, I can eat my curanto and tell you how, how, <laughs> how it tastes. <laughs> okay, let me see. It, se veía bien el curanto en todo caso. It looked good. Uh, Celeste, Celeste Andre. Um, tiene, tiene una pregunta. Um, Mientras, mientras tú, la, tú la lees, Eric, yo tal vez la puedo traducir. Uh, while you read it, Eric, I can translate it. Yes, please, yeah. Ok. So, Celeste mm -hmm. Landry pregunta, ¿tienes, ¿tienes algunas recomendaciones especiales? Ok. So, se, le, se le está preguntando a Eric si es que él tiene algún tipo de recomendación especial para poder como... Um, 
ayudar a los estudiantes a usar representaciones como parte de, 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 del pensamiento más, más avanzado en, en el mundo del, del aprendizaje remoto, ahora que estamos con COVID y todo eso, ¿verdad? Um, it, it, there's been a lot of resources online, so if there are teachers um, in this call, um, I like, um, I don't know if we'll have time to do this, maybe, maybe, um, let me just show this. I'll, I'll share my screen once again and make sure I share the right window. Okay, so I use this, um, this uh, uh, online thing called Nearpod. Nearpod is, is fun, is, is fun. Um, support students to create the drawings um, in a remote setting. So you can, uh, you share like this code with your students, they go to joinnearpod.com and then they're able to, um, to see it on their phones and on their phones they can draw um, stuff um, uh, uh, and it will go to you on the teacher end. Debbie, I'm going to stop right there. Uh, Eric. Uh, tiene como recomendación en, en estos tiempos de, de aprendizaje remoto ¿verdad? de ocupar esta aplicación que se llama Nearpad que uh, se puede encontrar en uh, was it join yeah maybe, maybe maybe you can type it on the on the chat no I don't think we have time for it but um uh, let's see if we have time for it but yeah no 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 I was saying the name if oh. you can type it on the on the chat Oh, so, yeah, yeah, Eric, Nearpod. Okay, sounds good. Sorry. Eric recommends this uh, esta application called Nearpad, where the students la bajan in their telephones, for example, or incluso sus tablets, and they can draw them, and then the professor can receive the drawings as a way that the students can continue using the drawings in the sala de class. Um, let me do this. Okay, so that's the website. Oh, wait, no, I just sent it to Dario, not to everyone. That was rude. <laughs> Here we go. Eric, Eric, Eric va a poner en el chat, ahí Eric envió en el chat el, el website, o la, la página web de Nearpad para que... So in this, you can collect drawings of students. You can also um, uh, display particular students. Um, but we can talk about this. Um, uh, you can try experimenting with this. It's it's a great website for remote learning. But yes, I agree with you. Sometimes students have to actively draw, and so that's where our Google Slides aren't really um, um, sufficient. So we have another question from Flavio. Eric. You want me to read to you? It said, Thank you very much. I'll, I'll read it. Yeah, no, I, okay. I can say it. You can translate it if you'd like. Ok, voy a, voy a leer la pregunta de Flavio. Déjenme leerla un poquito para poder traducirla. Ok, so, yeah, Eso, this Flavio. Is... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Ya. Yeah. Flavio está preguntando, le está preguntando a Eric cómo él piensa que los profesores deberían promover uh, el, el, el movimiento, digamos, desde lo más concreto al, 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 al pensamiento más abstracto, a las representaciones más abstractas, y cómo el CPA, el modelo CPA, mm -hmm. no, I don't know if you're familiar with that, Eric. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Copy, sí, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Se relaciona so... con las creencias de los profesores acerca de esto. So this is a great question, Flavio. I think um, in terms of uh, professional development, um, we can support, as we saw in the, uh, uh, the first study where, um, let me say this again, we should create communities where, of teachers where we can try out drawing out things that we don't have drawings to, such as our algorithm or our, um, yeah, our algorithms. Sorry, Eric, can you, can you repeat that? Sure, no, no problem. We should create communities of teachers um, where they can solve math problems together and use drawings instead of symbols and see what they come up with. The best way to do it is to try it out. Uh, Eric, Eric, Eric recommends that it's a good idea that the professors, in a collaborative or conjunta, create ways to draw and try that esas formas de dibujar uh, en, en la sala de clase. 
Um, you said that they tried them out in the classroom, right? Yeah. So let me say this again. So like um, with um, with the teachers in the university course, they were asked to think about a lot of um, ideas in um, using drawings. So they weren't allowed to use um, um, symbols. So here's an example. So these are drawings for proportional reasoning. Give me a second. So I, yeah. In the in, in university in, 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 in Wisconsin, Madison, right? No, in Georgia. In Georgia, okay. In the in la, in, in, in university in the United States, so the students who were taking or the docents in formation, they uh, were required to make drawings and they were not allowed to use symbols. So Eric is going to show this experience now. So um, just trying it out and see, like, can we reason through this with drawings and not rely on the apps, the symbols would, would be interesting to see what you come up with. And then the reason why I'm saying community is because, you know, you learn from other people. Eric está diciendo que, um, que, que fue interesante esto de, de, de poner la restricción para estos para esto estudiantes de que ellos no usaran símbolos, sino que usaran simplemente dibujos como una forma de ver, a ver, ¿es posible razonar en una forma más abstracta simplemente usando dibujo y no, y no usando símbolo? Y, y, y bueno, y es mucho mejor si se hace de forma colaborativa cuando muchas personas están discutiendo. Um, I'll take the, let, let's see. I can answer the second question from Alejandro first, and then I'll address Hamilton's. Um... Okay, Alejandro? Mm -hmm. At the end. Yeah, I'll read it a little bit. So I, I, I do want to, um, so the quick answer for this one, and I know you're still translating, Dario, but um, the last question, have you considered doing brain scans? Um, we, I have not, that is not my area of specialty, but I will um, shout out, there are um, uh, new mathematicians, at, at least the ones I know in the United States that do uh, neurology studies. I am thinking of, um, oh man, what's his name? He's at Michigan State. Um, that does some brain scans. Um, Hamilton or Huayang, um, he does um, room stuff, if you can think of his name. Um, um, but no, I have not heard, I have not considered doing brain scans. Um, but that would still be interesting to see if there are some, um, uh, no, uh, no. Um, uh, Can you give me one second? To... Yeah, sure, oh, I'm sorry. So, Alejandro, Alejandro está preguntando a Eric uh, si acaso puede uh, comentar un poco más acerca de cómo la, que, que no se consideran los dibujos como algo importante o sofisticado en matemática. Uh, y al mismo tiempo le está preguntando si es que él ha considerado usar uh, scanners cerebrales para, para ver la, la corteza visual y cómo se utiliza mientras se hace en matemática. Eric dijo que por el momento no lo han considerado. I don't know if you have anything else to add on that. Um, I'm going to look for stuff, but um, we'll take the last question, which is Hamilton's, and it's a little long. Okay. Go to Hamilton. Y esa probablemente sea la última pregunta del día. Hamilton Harrison. A ver. Dice, una distinción que fue relevante para mí fue... acerca de cómo el data presentado hoy día envuelve, envuelve a quién, quién generó la representación. En el primer estudio, la representación fue generada por los profesores en formación, mientras ellos resolvían un problema. Para después hacer una conexión con un procedimiento que es bien conocido. En el segundo estudio, la representación fue generada por el profesor en lugar de los estudiantes. Y los estudiantes interpretaron estas representaciones. So, okay. ¿tienes algún, uh, ¿Cuáles son tus pensamientos acerca de la generación versus la interpretación? Y si acaso eso es, eh, tiene alguna relevancia en, el, en, el, en la sala de clase o no. Uf. No puede ir a good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just remember the name of the person that does it in Michigan. His last name is, is Karnakaran. Um, 
and I am trying to look for his name, but I'll put it in the chat if I can come up with it. The other thing that Hamilton has noticed is for um, the one that's interested in uh, neuroscience, there is this chapter in the compendium published by NCTM, and it does have Andy Norton's work in it, and there's a lot of stuff with uh, brain work here, so you might be interested in reading some of that. Um, so for Hamilton's last question, um, Yes, so there is a lot of things to be said about generation and interpretation. And yes, I did gloss over that a little bit because there's, um, there's this work in physics education um, called meta-representational competence. I'll stop there, Daria. Okay. Existe este trabajo en... Trabajo en... Where is that work from? Ah, uh, physics education. Sorry. Physics, yeah. Ex existe existe uh, investigación en la, en la investigación en educación de la física acerca de las meta representaciones. Uh, and then you're going to explain what a meta... Yeah, it, well, okay. it's, it's a study about like how students generate and what they use to generate, and it doesn't necessarily involve interpretation. So, yes, there is a difference. So, Este, este estudio hace una, eh, se preocupa de, 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 cómo, de qué es lo que usan los estudiantes cognitivamente para poder interpretar, perdón, para poder generar representaciones, pero no, no incluye el tema de la interpretación. Y Eric dice que sí, que existe una diferencia entre generar la representación e interpretarla. So, um, in terms of if students generate it, I think in the classroom it is good to have students to discuss like what I told Berkeley earlier. It's like, what, uh, what do you like about this representation? And it will generate a lot of discussion about how, what students think a good representation is. Okay. That's it. Wait, can, can you say that again? And, sure. And, sorry. So, yeah, it's okay. So in terms of in the classroom, if students generate their own ideas or uh, generate their own representations, it's good to ask the other students what they think about student-generated representations that you won't get if you just interpret uh, representations. Right. So in the sala de clase, cuando, lo, cuando un estudiante genera una representación, es importante preguntarle a los compañeros de este estudiante qué es lo que, qué es lo que a ellos les gusta o qué es lo que opinan de esta representación. Um, so what did they think about the representation? I think yeah. I forgot mm -hmm. the last one. Um, uh, that, that type of conversation um, may not happen if you just ask about interpretation, uh, interpreting a teacher generated. Uh, representation. Entonces, es importante preguntarle a los estudiantes qué piensan acerca de las representaciones de otros estudiantes, porque ese tipo de conversación no, no ocurre en la sala de clases cuando eh, los estudiantes solamente interpretan las representaciones que generó el profesor o el maestro. Well, I think that's all the time we have, though. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, Daria, thank you so much for that interpretation. You know what, you know what you could do? You could, you, you sh I should, you should charge me money for that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric. No, that, if, if, if I misinterpret what you said, um, if somebody disagrees with what you were suggesting, maybe it was my fault. So. I know, it's okay. <laughs> I'm putting my email in the chat just in case you would like to okay. ask me any further questions. But Dario, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate you translating and, and, and uh, Elena for organizing this. I really appreciate it. No, thank you, my friend. Uh, y bueno, y thank you to everybody else. Muchas gracias a todos los que vinieron. Uh, espero que les haya gustado la presentación. Um, y si tienen más preguntas que, que quieran hacerle a Eric, Eric escribió su email en el chat. Uh, para aquellos que estén interesados en hacer la pregunta, que es I, I, es E, P, S, I, Y o Y arroba W I S C punto E D U para aquellos que estén interesados. And, y muchas gracias a todos. And thank you, Eric, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Everyone stay safe.